Good afternoon. Welcome to all our viewers on Facebook and YouTube channels and thanks for tuning in to another STRATCOM Talks from the NATO Strategic Communications Centre of Excellence. My name is Annie Geizo and I'm really pleased to be here and hosting another discussion on a fascinating report produced by the Centre of Excellence. This report is based on data collected between March and July 2020, during which, during which time all five Finnish political party leaders were women. The aim of this study was to identify and assess whether abusive messages received by the Finnish government ministers on Twitter were from inauthentic accounts. This also builds on three previous Finnish studies, two of which examining whether bots influenced the political discourse during the 2019 elections, and one looking at hate speech more generically towards politicians. We have two great experts with us today. One is our colleague from the Stratcom Centre of Excellence. You'll know him from previous reports on robo-trolling, expert Dr. Rolf Fredheim. His academic areas of interest include digital and cyber domain, and he's produced, like I said, several other great reports from the COE on social media platforms. The other is Dr. Pivy Tampera, an academic expert in communications and information sciences and current Head of Communications for the Prime Minister's Office in Finland. It's great to have you both with us. We'll also be able to listen to a short piece from social scientist Klaus Sedlenix from Riga Stradins University. He's a faculty member of the Communication and Anthropology Studies Department and the chair of the Latvian Association of Anthropologists. He's going to give us a short insight into why human online behaviours differ from how people might conduct themselves in real life. Clearly, this is a pertinent and timely discussion to have about free speech online and who should be potentially responsible for identifying and removing abuse from online public spaces. We should also not shy away from talking about why it's so easy to use categorising people by gender as a tool of disempowerment and manipulation. It's evident from other empirical research as well as anecdotal experience that women receive gendered and sexualized comments in many areas of social and professional life. But is this particular example, combining politics and gender-specific abuse, different? As always, please do send us your comments and questions throughout, not just at the end, but throughout this report uh, in the chat on Facebook and YouTube, and we'll try to get to as many uh, as we can and answer them. So turning to our experts now, if I can turn to Rolf first of all, could you give us a précis of the methodology, analysis and results of this report as you see them? Thank you, Annie. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be with you and our viewers on social media today. So um, I want to talk about our new report called Abuse of Power, Coordinated Online Harassment of Finnish Government Ministers. And I want to start by thanking my co-authors, Christina van Sant and Gundas Bergman Skorats, who did this fantastic work. Um, I thought I'd just start by reading the first sentence of the report. The Lipstick Brigade, Lipstick Girls, Feminist Quintet, Tampax Team. These are phrases popular on Finnish Twitter to refer to the current coalition in Finland, in which all five party leaders are women, led by Prime Minister Sanna Marin of the Social Democratic Party. The administration made international headlines as pioneers of gender equality and governance. Their election also provoked online resistance in the forms of abusive messages. Many assumptions about their political inexperience were accompanied by sexist and misogynistic language. So this report is now available on the Stratcom CRE website. It goes into a lot of detail, a lot of examples. It, uh, it uh, unpacks the main trends. I'll just gloss over those here today, I encourage you to look at the report directly. So if you can see my, my slides, I hope you can. Um, this report was uh, requested by the Prime, Min Prime Minister's office in Helsinki with the aim of understanding the scope of politically motivated abusive language on Finnish Twitter and to determine whether it is perpetrated by automated accounts. And when we started doing this research, it became immediately apparent that uh, gender was the defining, um, the defining characteristic of the abusive language that we were picking up. So like, like Annie mentioned in the, in the introduction, 
We draw on Twitter data from March to July of last year, which encompasses the state of emergency in Finland during the initial COVID lockdowns. As part of this research, we developed a series of completely novel tools to detect hate speech and to understand what, are, what sort of social media accounts are behind um, spreading the messaging. Now, like good researchers, we went in with some hypotheses. Coming out of the academic literature, we very much expected to find that female ministers were the subject of abuse to a greater degree than male ministers would be, and that this abuse would be particularly gendered. We also, based on previous research, expected to find relatively little coordinated inauthentic activity in the Finnish information space. However, the, there would be a potential for increased inauthentic activity at moments of crisis, such as elections or perhaps during the state of emergency. So we wanted to test whether that was in fact the case. And straight on to the findings, we found, to my mind, shockingly high levels of abusive messaging. So of the tweets sent directly at ministers, as much as 10% of them were identified by our algorithm as abusive or, or containing some sort of form of, of hate speech or, or, or slurs. Um, there were, however, very few threats of physical violence, which is what would be required for the police to have any interest in getting involved. So. We see this as probably an indication that the trolls know what sort of things they at least shouldn't be talking about when harassing politicians. But pretty much as expected, we found very low levels of automated activity in Finnish. I've, I've studied automation on social media for many years, and I've never seen a data set with so little automated activity. Um, however, the abuse that we found, it was very gendered. So irrespective of what the government was being criticized for on any given day, be it the COVID-19 response and immigration finished EU relations, the, the abusive messages, especially directed at female ministers, would us usually have some sexualized or gendered comments stuck at the end, you know, to just to make the, the criticism extra personal and horrible. So as I mentioned, we've we've done other reports on automation online. In particular, we've studied um, what bots say about the NATO presence in Eastern Europe. And this is published under the title of Robotron. And I just wanted to give this as an indication of how different the Finnish information space that we found was. So in the Finnish information space, we found half of all accounts were really easily recognizable as, as, human, as controlled by human um, people controlled by people, you know, real name, um, real names, real profile pictures, etc. with about 45% anonymous and the rest being institutional or news outlets. If we compare that to the Russian language space that we see talking about the NATO presence, we only see about 18% of the accounts as being recognizably human. And also for the English language conversation about NATO and the Baltics, a very much smaller percentage. So one of the things we did in the report was to try to map out who is talking about the ministers and, and how do they fit together within some sort of social network. So on this, on this graph, each dot represents one user and they are colored by the language that they predominantly tweet in. So as you might, as you might imagine, the, the dominant color up here, pink, these are accounts that tweet in, in the Finnish language, whereas green is English. And then there are some other smaller languages. I forget now exactly what black and orange is. And then we took this same constellation and used the different calculations to try to understand what sort of accounts are we talking about? Are these automated accounts? Are they anonymous accounts? Are they news accounts, etc.? So this second image shows the same, the same basic graph, but we've colored it differently here blue represents human or institutional accounts. And as you can see, the, fin the area that corresponds to the Finnish language environment is overwhelmingly a recognizably human space. It's a, it's a very, it's a real name environment for the, for the most part. There are some areas here marked in yellow that are predominantly anonymous. But if we're looking for pink areas on this graph, such as this one that I'm circling at the moment in a few 
a few down here. These represent the auto automated accounts, the bot accounts. So the bot accounts that were all tweeting at the prime minister and the other ministers, they were, they were usually tweeting in other languages. These were English accounts or Spanish accounts, Arabic accounts. And we, we, saw, we saw various ones, but very, very few Finnish language bots. There, there's really only two exceptions worthy of note. There's this interesting cluster out here, this one, which is partly Finnish, partly English. It's uh, made up of animal rights activists, and we think a lot of those accounts were automated. And also, there's a small cluster in here, but it's so small you can't even see it, where a couple of influencers have all their tweets auto automatically retweeted by bots. So when it comes to abusive messaging, we took the same graph and just reduced it to, to accounts that tweet in Finnish and then recolored it by whether these accounts usually send abusive messaging at the government. And here we have um, in red, clusters of accounts that were more likely to send abusive messages. There's, there's a larger cluster out here on the right, and there's a, a, a smaller, almost imperceptible group on the left. And this, this reflects the fact that, by and large, the Finnish information space is quite a clean space. There, is, there, there are not thousands and thousands of accounts sending abusive messaging. Instead, there are a few very loud voices who are responsible for the vast majority of the messages. In addition to this, we find that about one third of all the messages come from accounts that are outside the, the dominant social network. These are accounts that don't really follow other accounts. They don't seem to be connected in any way. They're, I call them burner accounts, the disposable accounts essentially, which have been created to be used very briefly. These, this is, these are the accounts I would look at to find um, patterns of um, inauthenticity and coordination. However, when we did this, we did not find groups of accounts active at the same time. Basically, in my assessment, this is, this is Finnish citizens, sometimes through their real accounts, sometimes through fake accounts, tweeting at the, at the government. This is not some giant troll farm, and it's not evidence of, of large automation. So I'm, I'm almost done here. I just wanted to show this graph, which takes the, the list of ministers that we were collecting information for, and uh, divides them by, by gender, if you like, and, and shows the percentage of the messages directed at them, which were abusive. And with the really only one exception, all the female ministers receive vastly more abusive messaging than the male mem mem members of the, of the cabinet. It, it really is quite disproportionate. Um, another Another finding I wanted to briefly introduce you to is that um, we had anticipated elevated abusive messaging levels during the state of emergency, but that seems not to be the case. Instead, if the state of emergency was lifted in June, this period through June and July is the one where the, the percentage of abusive messaging messages is the highest. This was the time of the Black Lives Matter, of negotiating the recovery, deal with the EU. In, in comparison, the, the period, the state of emergency is relatively quiet, a little bit interesting. There's much more about this in the report, so I will just I will more or less leave this here, except we, we developed some clever algorithms to identify what was the subject of the abuse. And by and large, you know, the, the, main, the main subject was bad government, you know, government incompetence. This was, was responsible for spikes in May and then again in July. And then you can see how during the summer period, um, June and July, these themes of sexist language and racist language became much more dominant than they had been previously. So to wrap up, we find that there, are, there is quite extensive targeting of Finnish ministers with abusive language but we find that it is largely not done by bots or automated accounts. In general, compared to other spaces we've studied, the Finnish information space is relatively clean. So my guess would be if we repeated this for other countries, not only would we find similar volumes of abuse targeting prominent women in public life, but I think there would be more bot involvement. I think, I think we'd find an even worse picture. Um, 
as is perhaps unsurprising, but it's the, the ministers from this left-wing government are mostly targeted by the political opposition. But I see this not as a question of left and right, rather than a question of who is in or out of power. Female ministers are especially likely to be targeted with gendered abuse. And a reminder for all of us that a lot of hostile messaging, messaging we might not like, is in fact created by authentic domestic voices. We shouldn't, as practitioners, assume that everything we don't like is fake and, and produced you know, in foreign, foreign bot farms. But that might lead us not to take the challenges as seriously as we should. So with that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Annie. Fascinating to hear that the activity showed such low levels of automation, but that the level of abuse was actually really severe. And also that 50% of the accounts making these statements were attributable to named authentic personal Twitter accounts. But I think you made a key point that we shouldn't hide from the fact that people are out there making abusive comments and it's not always bots just because we don't enjoy listening to what, what people have to say. We're receiving a couple of questions already on the stream, but I'm going to leave them until after we've heard from Pivy and also our social scientist, Clavs. So we're now going to turn to the pre-recorded piece from Clavs and hear what he's got to say about the anonymizing effect of making online comments versus making comments in real life. Internet allows uh, oneself to distance uh, from from the results of your action. Uh, you do not see the other person. You do not feel the other person's uh, reactions. So uh, you can act only on your uh, impulses, on on your first uh, kind of uh, reactions that that you think uh, might be in some situations appropriate. But you do not have to consider uh, the other person's uh, uh, feelings, and you also do not uh, think about uh, your own consequences uh, because in in uh, real conversations it is always uh, you have to keep in mind what uh, what the reaction will be from the from the other side and you have to uh, somehow restrain yourself also I think that uh, there are marginal groups uh, that get harassed on internet more and uh, and there are also uh, uh, the harassers are also more prominent in in the internet and those are also uh, minority groups uh, very few people are actually aggressive but that's that's also the s same situation in real life of course we can see that uh, that the the uh, marginal groups that would be harassed in real life but they also get harassment in in internet and uh, and from uh, from research and from surveys we can see that there are differences for instance how males and females uh, um, behave in uh, in conversations in real life just as in in uh, uh, on the internet and what is characteristic is that uh, that males are um, more or less more aggressive but also more more tolerant towards aggression so they do not feel uh, harassed so much uh, they do not uh, feel um, uh, intimidated they they somehow treat these uh, rough uh, games so to say as part and parcel of what they do on on everyday life they they have to establish their own uh, 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 life situation or or their own position in uh, in a more or less aggressive way and uh, female conversation is uh, is less tolerant towards this uh, this kind of conversation so they also feel more intimidated more injured when somebody attacks them verbally or, or in any other way and and that is uh, characteristic for both uh, real life and, and internet but in internet probably it is uh, more um, prominent because there the again the the, uh, the distance is uh, larger and uh, and so the attacks tend to be also more um, inhumane so to say I probably am uh, on that side where where Free speech is uh, is a very important feature of our life, and uh, all uh, restrictions are leading uh, in in wrong direction. 
uh, in, in more problems because uh, then you have to somehow set limit. Of course, we, we are trying to set limits always on, on free speech, but the more uh, restraints you have, uh, the more problematic it becomes. And, uh, and it also leads towards uh, um, situations when there are some, some areas of, uh, of uh, knowledge or, or life that uh, somehow people are not supposed to speak about at all. And, and that is a very, very fertile ground for all different kinds of conspiracy theories. Why are we not allowed? Why, why uh, are we uh, muted uh, on, on these particular topics? Though there, there must be some kind of conspiracy behind that and, uh, and everybody who speaks uh, anything on that topic becomes a prophet suddenly. Several years ago we, we did uh, research on, uh, on internet trolls and we wanted to understand uh, what is the impact and who are the trolls and try to look deeper on, on uh, these uh, internet comments uh, uh, and those comments were about uh, diff different kinds of politically uh, sensitive issues like independence, war in, in Ukraine and, and something like that and at that time uh, it was, there, there was a lot of worry about the, the internet uh, uh, trolls that are being uh, uh, bred in, in the troll farms in somewhere in, in, uh, in Moscow or, or somewhere there. And we wanted to understand what is actually happening there. What we found out was that, uh, that most probably those uh, authors of those uh, comments uh, were, uh, were uh, based more or less locally and, and they were more or less equal on both sides. So they were trolls from, uh, from pro-Russian, so to say, side and, uh, and trolls uh, from the other side as well. And, uh, and it seemed that, that uh, our uh, worry that, the, that this is somehow organized uh, from somewhere, at, at least in, in this particular topic, uh, was uh, was uh, overstated and m later on like uh, these uh, during this year we also uh, paid attention to to what is happening in the uh, in social media and we figured out that uh, that social media is uh, incredibly bad uh, uh, instrument to understand what is happening in 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 the society in general because uh, the the attitudes uh, that are being uh, expressed on social media are uh, uh, way more uh, polarizing and way more extreme than than what is uh, uh, what can be seen in uh, in for instance social uh, in in uh, um, uh, surveys uh, when when we measure the same things also s our surveys uh, demonstrate that uh, women tend to be more shy so they they shy away from uh, from these uh, um, harassments and men tend to to be more uh, reactive so so they they try to defend themselves more uh, I think that that maybe one of the ways is uh, is uh, to to play along this game. Like uh, in uh, again in in real life, uh, we see that for instance, uh, women who get in in managerial positions, which are which tend to be dominated by males, they have to play along this this game uh, not to be let down, because otherwise they they uh, demonstrate to to those uh, aggressively communicating males that the males are winning this game and uh, so so maybe uh, one of the things uh, to do is is to try to to engage more in these conversations on the other hand this is a very toxic uh, environment and uh, it is a very good question whether it is worth doing it in general because the cost is also very very high Really interesting to hear Klaus talking about the differences between male and female behaviours and reactions. I'd be interested to hear more about whether our viewers consider that genuine sex differences exist in responses to online and real-life abuse. Now over to our next guest, Pivy. You've worked in and taught communications and information risk for a number of years. What do the results of this report tell us about how people are interacting online? 
Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inv inviting me to discuss this important issue and thank you for producing such an, an thorough and, and really uh, interesting and insightful report. Uh, it's, it, um, I read it with, uh, with uh, high interest. Um, I would like to, um, I have basically four points I would like to raise concerning the result, research results and the issue in general. And then later on, we can go uh, back to, to the, your question you, you addressed to me. So I think this report highlights really well the, the quality and the quantity of hate speech. And that is reality for female ministers, um, and not only in Finland, but also, also elsewhere. Uh, but this is not only a, a problem um, what um, female ministers have to kind of encounter. Uh, it happens also at the local level politics. So, for example, city council members, female female members of city councils might might experience same kind of feedback online and also also offline. Um, and this report highlights really well hate speech and abusive language on Twitter in certain kind of period. But, uh, but uh, we see it as a, as a wider societal problem. Um, and also, again, not only in Finland, but, uh, but also elsewhere. Um, and female politicians actually are not the only group subjected to this kind of uh, abusive messages and language. It's also, it, this applies also to other um, uh, female, for example, artists or researchers, uh, but also male, male actors. So uh, we have seen uh, in Finland that also um, academic researchers raising questions of immigration, for example, might end up uh, getting a lot of feedback and, and hostile, hostile uh, messages after their public, public appearance. Also civil servants, such as police officers and different kind of opinion leaders uh, have, uh, have to kind of leave in the middle of the of the problem and regardless of their gender so people who participate uh, in public discussion due to their profession uh, either on social media platforms or uh, other media channels are subjected to this uh, this also applies to individuals representing a certain prof uh, profession or people belonging who belong to different kind of minority groups be it uh, lg uh, BT rights, uh, language or cultural minority groups. So uh, those people uh, are are subjected to the similar kind of message messaging and and behavior. Um, and what is uh, what is the most worrying, in my opinion, is that what what does this uh, amount and the quality of hate speech do to our democracy and our public debate? Um, this is actually one way to undermine uh, our democracy and, and, uh, and basically freedom of speech. Uh, it's really important, it's really crucial for democracy and democratic states that people can express their opinions freely, criticize politicians, uh, civil servants, uh, researchers, you name it, freely. Um, but um, freedom of speech cannot uh, mean license for defamation and harsh abuse, abusive use of language. So that, dyna, that kind of debate uh, is ongoing, has been going on in Finland for a long time. And, and, and I think that now the social media platforms just um, are uh, a new channel or kind of a platforms makes the problem or or this kind of language uh, only visible to us. I think this this problem has has been here uh, already, kind of like all the time, as uh, as long um, when people have have overall debated something publicly. But social media platforms make it really visible, and we it's really hard to kind of close our eyes uh, in front of the this phenomenon. Um, so um, so everyone of us should really carry responsibility for, for keeping this our in, information environment safe and to kind of safeguard public debate. And this is something um, what I feel that this report also um, uh, plays an important role is that this problem is addressed, this is discussed, and, and that we shed light to this issue so that uh, people acknowledge it, their 
uh, they become aware of it and that uh, we could together um, make sure that uh, that discussion uh, could be as safe as, as possible. Of course, there is no silver bullet or one remedy to kind of uh, solve this, this issue, but um, responsibility brings um, also uh, to my basic last point, what I wanted to make is the responsibility of social media platforms ta in tackling this problem. Um, they, they have done a lot to, to um, tackle disinformation and information influencing activities online. Um, but um, algorithms boost topics which are emo uh, emotional or cause emotional response and reactions among users. Uh, and messages, of course, they spread fast and they are really easy to, to amplify. Um, but living in a small country and representing a, a, a rather small language, which is spoken less than six million people, I feel that these actions done by social media platforms do not really reach our information space. Um, so there should be uh, more effective ways to do hate speech detection, or then find other other remedies to to uh, solve this problem. Uh, but yeah, this is um, this is uh, although female ministers like this report highlights uh, are subjected uh, in a disproportionate way. Uh, to hate speech, this is not only a problem um, what they they uh, experience, but it's it's a much wider wider issue, and it's really important that we we address it here uh, and and discuss it. Thanks so much for that, Pivy. Uh, I agree that social media algorithms can only do so much to tackle hate speech, and it sounds like there's so much more that can be done but it's a really difficult question to work out who's responsible for putting that investment in. So if we move to questions now, just as a starter, and I'll ask you first, Pivy, given the pervasive use of stereotypes and gender to categorize the majority of experience and behavior in all our lives, are you surprised by the level of vitriol or the severity of the, uh, the gendered abuse that was directed at the Finnish ministers? Well, to be honest, I, I'm not surprised. Uh, like I said uh, just uh, earlier that um, this tone of voice and the narratives uh, spreading online, uh, part of them, uh, luckily, it's only, only if I, if I may, 10% of, of the messages analyzed were abusive. It's, it's still quite a high percentage. Um, but but every one of us being active online in on Twitter or Facebook or other platforms can experience and see that the language used is really can be really hostile and can be really abusive. So so it didn't come uh, as a surprise to me. Okay, and presumably the actual number will be higher than ten percent, as the automation can only look for certain things that it actually knows what to look for. Was a manual review carried out for comparison? This is a question for me, I suppose. Um, <laughs> um, yes, what can I say? When we when we designed our algorithm, we were basing it off of examples of abusive messaging that were given to us by Finnish researchers who we who we contacted as we were doing the the study design. And for sure, the, these examples were kind of the most obvious, the clearest examples of abusive language. This was pretty explicit abuse rather than implicit. So there's all, all, all kinds of forms of, of messaging which might be harder to pick up using this type of approach. And um, um, arguably, yes, I suppose it is likely that the number is higher. Of course, what we did was through the manual review, like you said, we tried to calibrate it so that we had roughly a, a balance between the false negatives and the false positives, if you want to get technical about it. So, so we think the estimates are kind of in the right ballpark, but it's never perfect. Yeah, really difficult to make an algorithm that's going to be able to sniff out every instance of hate speech. And it's a subjective topic as well. So Rolf, the report found low levels of bot activity meaning that the gender abuse was predominantly created by actual real individuals. What's this telling us about how some Finns are using social media? 
I think uh, I think Clavs uh, touched upon this in his in his comments earlier on that um, when you when people have access to to this this tool of social media, it's a it's it's a very powerful tool, right? And it's a, it's an amazing thing to be able to communicate directly with everybody. In the past, social interactions were always mediated somehow. It wouldn't be possible just to fire off angry angry little messages and actually have them be received in the past. So it's a very powerful tool, which is prone to abuse. I don't think there's anything in particular about fins that make them more or less likely to misuse this particular tool. Um, I think, I think like, like you said, what, what, what we find is that the majority of, of social media users use the space very well, but that there is an, an angry minority that is very vocal. And another thing Clubs touched on was this idea of how strange it is to go to Twitter or social media to find um, sociological responses. But but it's also very, very, because it's so direct, it's possible that even though it might be completely unrepresentative of what people actually think, it, it, uh, it affects the recipient in a very direct way. So we, we know from, from other research that this type of messaging has a very serious chilling effect on women's willingness to take on publicly visible roles of power. And I think we need to have a broader societal conversation about what sort of rules govern how we behave in this online space, just as we have rules and conventions for how we behave offline. Okay, thanks for that, Rolf. Another question from online from Alexa. What's the rationale for discussing gender differences in reactions to abuse? So saying that women don't take it well when the issue is the harassers, not the victims. Who would like to jump in on this one? I can I can jump in. Um, right, I also think that it's it's not the reaction what is the problem, but actually the the abusive language as such. So, um, like I said earlier, oh, I think that people should really think twice before before they publish something uh, really hostile. Um, of course, it's easy to, easy to say um, some some people do it and with their own names. Um, but yeah, it's that it's it's really hard to kind of say that what what things you you should be able to say and what not. But but the things would you say those kind of things uh, face to face when meeting with people? And if if you if you wouldn't do it, then maybe you shouldn't also uh, either do it online. But I think this is connected with the with the um, distancing uh, kind of uh, effect. Like uh, like Clive said in his uh, interview, that it's it's somehow easy to distance oneself uh, while you are you although you are using your personal account and then and writing something something uh, in Twitter, for example. Uh, but but it also it's also visible with the privacy issues. People publish. Uh, quite a lot of information concerning their private life, uh, their hobbies and family and things. And it seems that, that although, um, although they know that it's, uh, those platforms are, are fully public, then they still, still do it. And it's the same with, with, uh, with the um, hostile messages, that it's somehow easier, uh, easier to do it and, and, and bombard people with, with uh, abusive messages because it's they are somehow distant and and like they wouldn't be real or like they it wouldn't hurt as much as it would it would do when when uh being said uh, face to face i'm gonna seize the opportunity to pick up on that pivy thank you and um add my own question and analogy so over half the abusive messages were sent from anonymous accounts online so not bots or trolls but the user details were obscured uh, which the report states removes accountability and I agree so as Clavs said online it's possible to hide uh, and Clavs talked about the distancing effect that you've also um, just highlighted there with online abuse so how do we challenge those that want to hide but also want to attack at the same time if you'll allow me to use an analogy if you 
want to purchase a gun, you need to give your personal data about your name, your identity, your address, your phone number. If you're going to weaponize your speech online, why are you allowed not to give that data? What are your suggestions for, for tackling this particular problem? So in real life, you are forced to, to give data when you want to use a weaponized device. Online, it doesn't seem like there's that responsibility or, or demand to do so. Yeah, it's a really tricky question. Uh, the easy answer would be, of course, everybody should use their real name and, and, and face. And, and before getting an account, you should, you should give your personal uh, details uh, and phone number. But then um, when we speak about global uh, social media platforms, then uh, being anonymous and being able to, to uh, not use your own name or face, it's really, it might be really important in an authoritarian countries where people, people for example, are, uh, are promoting pro-democratic movements. So, so it's, it's, it's really a tricky question. Uh, uh, and yeah, I don't know if maybe, maybe there are some, uh, some good um, ideas among the audience. Uh, and maybe maybe you can give some suggestions how to solve this. But, but I don't have a kind of a, a one, one remedy for this. No, absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a very tricky question. Rolf, did you have anything to add on that? Thanks, Annie. Um, so, so from my perspective, this is less a question of anonymity and more a question of um, um, having accountable or durable online identities so that it's harder just to dispose of an, an, an account and create a new one. So, so if, you've, if you've got an account, then you're, you're somehow stuck with it and the record of what that account has performed is visible that you that is that it would be harder to create 50 different parallel personas and to to use them to to various ends online i think i think i think this is a conversation more about how we we govern access to these to these online spaces um, there have been some in, quite interesting experiments about the, the quality of conversation in different online spaces depending on the architectural decisions used when setting them up. So the, the challenge Facebook, Twitter, etc. have is that these decisions were taken 10 years ago, and they're now locked into how the platform works. But if you were designing a system from scratch now, you'd probably do it differently. By a number of accounts, one of the most civil spaces in the commenting, in commenting online is the comment section of the Financial Times. And this is um, anonymous environment, people operate under pseudonyms, but these pseudonyms are fixed because they've signed up to the Financial Times with a credit card through which they, they, they pay for their subscription. So it's much harder just to tear that up and to, to start a new account with the, with the newspaper. So when you have this kind of financial buy-in, you have ver verification through the, through the financial system that it is a specific individual, but they're able to operate under a pseudonym of their choice, that creates for better results often than an anonymous free-for-all like on Twitter. But also it can be better than a, a real name environment where people feel very constrained in what they're willing to talk about in public. Okay, thanks very much for that, Rolf. We've got a few more questions coming in online. Was there evidence of real users operating different accounts with different voices or psychological mindsets, i.e. one account being very abusive and then one that's more reasonable sounding? Rolf, do you want to start? We, we didn't find evidence of that. I mean, it's not to say that it's not there. We couldn't go down on the level of comparing, are there any two accounts that look like they might be run by the same person? But what we, what we didn't see were clusters of accounts that had either that had similar characteristics. So what, we, what, what you might expect to see was that some accounts post in sequence or on the same days or, or always on the same topics or, or something like this, that there was some sort of coordination or synchronization. And we saw, I'd, I'd like to say we saw no evidence of that. I'm, I'm sure there was some, maybe on the level of one, two or three accounts, but, but not in the double digits, I don't believe. Okay. 
From the findings of this report, and this is to Rolf again, and of the three related Finnish reports previously, it appears that Finland is a success story in terms of low bot propagation and influence. So what's the explanation for that? And what can other nations learn from that example? So I think, I think it's important to consider structural factors in Finland, right? So if we, if we think about troll farms or that are used in the advertising industry to, or in, to boost influences standing online to post fake reviews on restaurants, etc. These are usually English language content created in third world countries. So if people are being paid pennies to type out fake restaurant reviews, be that in India or in, in well, this, this, the subcontinent is quite popular, right? And you've got other countries like the Russian Federation, Ukraine, etc. So the Russian language environment where the wages are also sufficiently low for this to be a viable business model. I, with wages, what they are in Finland, I just don't think it makes any sense to go down that kind of route. I do think if we are looking to the future, that there might be some, some bigger challenges coming with the new advances in artificial intelligence, which is increasingly able to generate text, generate images, generate audio in any language. So it's not, it's not tied to just working for English. This was a problem five, 10 years ago when we started working in this space. There'd be some great tool, but it only works for English. Today, the clever, the clever data scientists are in the process of overcoming that hurdle. And I think it will soon be the case that it's possible for somebody in a foreign country who doesn't speak the language to generate comments or tweets in Finnish or Latvian or other sort of more niche languages, which hadn't been the case previously. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see developments in this area. Thanks, Rolf. Pivy, if I can ask you to comment first on this one, the biggest triggers for abusive responses online were COVID-19, liberal political announcements, immigration and the Finnish EU political relationship. Is there a gendered angle to these uh, topics, the attacks on these topics specifically? Would we have expected to see different topics creating spikes in trolling with male politicians? Yeah, I think that uh, we wouldn't see different kind of topics if we uh, were speaking about a trolling targeted to males. Since these uh, four topics you mentioned have been um, have been the most he heated up topics uh, for a longer period already. So uh, EU politics uh, recovery deal, um, COVID-19 related crisis management measures being taken, decisions taken by the government. I think that uh, if we had a 100% male minister cabinet, we would we would experience still hostile uh, messages since this COVID-19, of course, is is causing uh, or people are getting tired of of the pandemic and and therefore reactions are also also getting more more emotional. So um, and what comes to immigration, that has been a kind of a if I may say, say sensitive topic since 20, uh, 2015, when the Europe uh, experienced the refugee crisis. So, so I wouldn't say that we, we would have different topics if it was about male, male ministers and, and male actors being, being a target. Thank you. Rolf, did you have anything to add on that one? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the topics are the same. It's just... Uh, the, the level of abuse, it's much more personal and it's much more gendered when it's directed at, at women. It's, uh, there's a qualitative difference in the type of messaging, but the subject is the same. Okay, another question from online from Simon Cruz. Coming from a NATO STRATCOM perspective, do you see any potential security implications of this kind of online abuse? In short, how is this a question for a security think tank? I'm going to open that up to the floor. 
Okay, so how is this a question for a security think tank? What, what are the potential um, I, security implications of yes. this kind of online abuse? Well, the main security implication that we see through this is the use of the automated accounts and the coordination in their activity. And the type of activities that they engage in can be quite wide ranging from disseminating news articles of particular flavor from posing as citizens from a different country, from, from um, promoting or, or slandering individual political candidates, etc. So these are these are techniques that, that misuse the affordances of the social media platform. And potentially coordinated abuse is one of those things, because as we know, this, this is something that can have a chilling effect on the willingness to participate in, in public spaces in political life. Be that, be that about women, but I, I think you could say the same thing about sexual minorities, about other types of minorities. Um, all kinds of groups might be targeted in a systematic way, which would have an, a, the effect of dissuading participation. And that is potentially incredibly corrosive within a democratic society. So I, I do see that there is um, the, there is a security angle here. Also, more broadly, the, the tools for understanding this space are, would be the same, almost irrespective of what the sub, the, the tone or the substance of the messaging might be. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, we have a question from the previous deputy director, Ivar. Uh, who should govern the conversations on the social media platforms? Should it be the owners who earn the profit or is it a state responsibility? Either party would like to put themselves forward. Well, um, I would say that um, that governments or social media platforms, of course, um, they have a role here since they offer a space for discussion uh, and therefore um, we should maybe discuss more about social media regulations or the ways ways we could make this uh, uh, online information environment more safe. Uh, what governments can do and what actually has been has been done here in Finland is to to um, try to find out measures how to combat online shaming more effectively. Um, the uh, Finnish Ministry of Interior appointed a working group to prepare uh, concise proposals for measures to combat um, online shaming uh, last year. And, and uh, as a result, the report is, is uh, available online. As a result, uh, they, um, the working group recommends that um, support provided for victims of, of online shaming, and this applies now to, uh, to all the all the uh, citizens or people people uh, living in Finland, uh, so that the support should be uh, improved, and different ways should be um, should be found to to kind of uh, make the process more more coherent, and then also employer support for employees. Uh, in the event of online shaming should be ensured uh, by drawing up different kind of guidelines for situations where where employees might or freelancers or volunteers might uh, might be subjected to online shaming and that of course applies to people when they uh, when they experience this kind of uh, behavior when participating in the employers activities so uh, so government can of course do do some precautionary measures and also then develop tools how to how to improve protection and then also uh, if a person is is being subjected to this kind of behavior then how to support uh, that person uh, during the during the case so so there are some some things which should and could can be done yeah i'm interested to know actually how people have been protected and what sort of support they've received given the explicit nature of some of the messages that the Finnish ministers were, were receiving uh, which I read in the reports. So how has this behavior actually affected the jobs of those politicians? How are they practically managing those instances of abuse on a day-to-day -day basis? Do they, do they get the information or is it filtered before it gets to them? 
Well, if you are being subjected to, to uh, uh, these kind of messages, of course, you can then uh, uh, contact police and then uh, then the um, police uh, or law enforcement will then uh, check and investigate the, the cases. That's That, of course, applies to everyone. Uh, everyone. Um, and then um, there, there are some precautionary measures what can be done. Um, so some some suggest, for example, that that those persons shouldn't read the messages themselves. That there, there should be other people taking care, of filtering and 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 reading the messages and then uh, checking them through. Um, that it's 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 too um, stressful for for that uh, person who is who is the target. I'd certainly agree that. I don't think it should be the vulnerable individual, in this case, the female minister, who who has the burden of trying to tackle that just because you're the woman, you're the problem. But how do we decipher who's a genuine misogynist or racist when they're um, perpetrating online trolling and who's using a legally protected characteristic just for divisive purposes for political um, slandering? Either of you would like to offer a insight into that. I'm going to ask you, Rolf, how do we make a decision between who's saying something that they genuinely believe, even though it's abusive and unpleasant, and who's using it as a lever for political division? Yeah. So if, if we tried to assess something like that, we wouldn't, we wouldn't really be looking at the content of what they are saying. We'd be looking at the behavioral characteristics of the account. So is there something strange or unusual about the patterns that we can observe in the data? Is there something that indicates that this account is, let's say, active during the wrong business hours, or if it is um, somehow posting in synchronization with, with other accounts? Um, but when it comes to reading into the motivations of individual people operating individual accounts, there's, there's very little we can there's very little we can actually say about that. I think, in a way, dealing with the problem of external influence of bots acting as a swarm to affect a, a, a domestic conversation, that's almost an easier problem to tackle. Then you're taking up questions of regulation with social media companies. You're arguing that, that they should be restricting the ability of bad actors to aut automate accounts and to pose as as sort of fake personas, right? But that's kind of an, an easier thing to do. Whereas if you're dealing with individual actors scattered across a, a domestic space, then really you're, you're, the, the solutions are, are within education and broader societal conversations about what are acceptable behaviors online. I mean, for this, there is no quick fix. Absolutely. Uh, another question from online what is the criteria for determining whether speech is hostile or abusive I know we've talked about there being a gray space and it being a, a subjective topic so how do we how do we go about determining that on in the online sphere because in real life it's slightly easy more easy to determine what's abusive Pivy do you have an answer on that one Well, if the commenting is about uh, uh, clothing or looks or uh, somehow the personality of a of a public figure or a minister, then I think it's it's it shouldn't be um, accepted. If it's about the, the content or the subject or or the topic uh, people are debating about or or discussing, then it's uh, of course you are supposed to kind of accept also really critical feedback but if it's about your personality your looks clothing what especially females uh get commented uh, on then then it's it shouldn't be shouldn't be accepted that is that is my personal view okay i'm going to take one more question from online is there any understanding of the duty of care that each parliament within the alliance has to individual members of parliament in relation to abusive online content? Pivy. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I had a, I had a problem with the connection. 
Is there a duty? Is there a parliamentary or ministerial duty of care from the government towards members of parliament or ministers regarding abusive online content? Uh, yeah, there is, um, there is, and there are some procedures being followed. Followed, and overall, um, this um, we are we are going to have local elections uh, in upcoming June. And now we are preparing a, a, a big campaign uh, highlighting the the importance of of uh, safe public debate and and uh, highlighting the importance of that every one of us should should carry the responsibility for for uh, keeping this uh, public discussion uh, uh, good and and safe. So we are this this topic is overall on our agenda, not only. Uh, in, in political space, but as, as civil servants, we are paying attention to this. We are out of time now and we have to wrap up, but a lot of very interesting and stimulating questions raised during this discussion. Here's hoping we can continue this dialogue going forward. So many thanks to our experts. Really appreciate your time today. And also to those of you watching who sent in comments and questions in the chat. Please do join us next Wednesday, the 20th 4th of March at the same time when we'll be discussing audience analysis. Thank you and goodbye. I guess we can go now, right?